Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Garrett Schmidt, and I'm the managing editor for VBC Exhibit Hall. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's live webinar, which is the fourth in a four-part series uh, called All Roads Lead to Value-Based Care. And this particular one is titled Real Life Oper Oper <laughs> Oper operationalization, that's hard for me to say, uh, of VBC. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to welcome you all to today. If you hadn't heard the other three, don't worry about that. Um, that's fine. Uh, you, you won't be lost and we'll have links that afterwards, you know, we'll send so you can go check those out. But uh, a few items of note before we get started. Um, everyone has joined today in listen-only mode, so this is a, kind of a traditional webinar format. We can't see you or, or hear you, so you don't need to worry about turning off your camera or anything. Uh, but we do want to hear from you. We're going to have a time for Q&A towards the end of the presentation. So if you have a question at any point, uh, go ahead and use your control module, which is uh, at the top, uh, should be at the top, there's a little question bar, and you can submit a question there. And uh, we're going to get to as many as we can. We have a big audience today, but we're going to get to as many as we can. If we don't get to yours for some reason, uh, someone will reach out to you uh, via email afterwards, and we'll make sure we answer your question. So don't worry. Uh, also, um, the webinar is being recorded. So what's going to happen is afterwards, uh, maybe within the hour or so, you'll receive an email, and there will be a link to where you can uh, watch or rewatch the presentation itself or download the slides, and there'll be some other information there for you as well. Uh, so without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, our speakers today. We have Ms. Nadia Angela Du, and she is the VP of Data Science and the Chief uh, Statistician, and also uh, Janine Savage, and she is the Division President with Point Right. So welcome. I think uh, Ms. Savage is gonna get us started. Thanks so much, Garrett. So I am the division president of Point Right um, at NetHealth, and I'm an RN by clinical background. I spent about 16 years operating nursing facilities and other post-acute settings, and I found there that I had a passion for health information technology and for business intelligence and analytics in particular, and um, moved into a role where I could assist other types of pre providers and stakeholders across the healthcare continuum use technology to improve their outcomes. And that's what I've been doing for about the last 10 years. And Nadia, I'll ask you to introduce Hi. yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the VP of Data Science and Chief Statistician at NetHealth. My background is in math and statistics. Um, predominantly my application area, however, throughout my career has been the healthcare uh, setting. Uh, in my past life, more of um, on the research side for the prevention of infectious diseases and um, last seven years on the industry side, working on analytics and data science and predictive modeling and VBP analytics that we're going to talk about uh, today. And over the last seven years, Nadia and I have been working together with our teams, um, helping providers and payers and state governments implement value-based care programs. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So at NetHealth, we provide specialized consulting and analytic services, software solutions, and comprehensive support across the healthcare continuum to many different types of providers and payers. And as a state government and payer partner, we help them accelerate their value-based care innovations to help them transform payment and healthcare delivery. And we find that to be very exciting and very meaningful work. So in doing that, we work with state Medicaid agencies to advance the goals and objectives that they have for their state quality strategies. And particularly with Medicaid and other types of health plans, we help them fulfill their value-based contracting requirements and also um, achieve more effective and more efficient care. Um, we help them design, implement, operate, and evaluate value-based care programs, in particular pay for performance programs um, that align with their quality strategy. And we provide to all of their stakeholders actionable insights to help them make more informed decisions and achieve improvements in their quality and their outcomes. And we're going to share some of that experience with you today. 
The learning objectives for today's session are to identify some key factors that contribute to the success of value-based care programs that are effective in, um, in informing outcomes to talk about and describe the role of data analytics in supporting the implementation of VBC programs and how they enable more informed decision making and how their use impacts actual outcomes in the real world. And to summarize the relationship between providers using real-time analytics to better manage patients and their quality measure performance, their incentive payments, healthcare utilization, and costs. So let's start by talking a little bit about the landscape of value-based care. The big question, why? Why are we even heading down this road? And the big answer, or a big part of the answer, is the CMS strategy. CMS, of course, uh, in government programs, tends to set the tone across the healthcare continuum. And uh, when they issued a refresh of their strategic vision a couple of years ago, they really doubled down on the concept of accountable care. And in order to achieve the goals of accountable care, that is improving quality, increasing access, impacting social determinants of health, having better utilization of the healthcare system, and decreasing cost across the continuum, CMS um, has framed some very um, specific objectives and goals um, that are very, very aggressive in terms of moving healthcare providers and payers towards more accountable care. So as we, we look at it, there are kind of six major types of value-based care programs and alternative payment models. The first, pay for performance programs or P4P, these types of programs provide financial incentives, um, typically supplemental payments, sometimes also penalties, for providers um, toward the achievement of certain targets and performance metrics and outcomes. Accountable care organizations are groups of healthcare providers that assume responsibility for both the cost and the quality of care um, that is delivered to a defined population and they receive a shared savings or sometimes participate in shared risk based on the performance across um, those patients in that population. Capitation or full risk contracts refers to paying a fixed amount per patient per month or sometimes per year to a healthcare provider or organization or group of providers, regardless of the services rendered to the patients or the to that patient. So providers are then responsible for delivering comprehensive care within that reimbursement model. Bundled payments are initiatives that issue a single payment for all services that are related to a specific condition or episode, um, such as, for example, a joint replacement bundle. And providers that are providing care within the bundle are responsible for managing costs while maintaining um, certain quality outcomes and meeting certain quality targets. Quality withholds refer to providers having a portion of their payments withheld initially and then returned if specific quality and cost targets are met. And this incentivizes providers to achieve better quality care and more cost efficient care so that they see the return of um, that withhold. And in some of these types of programs, they can even receive back more than was initially withheld. Patient-centered medical homes, or PM, PCMHs, receive additional payments for providing a comprehensive and coordinated and patient-centered um, portfolio of care. And these often serve as a central point for managing all of a patient's health care needs, um, including social needs, and um, really focusing on things like social determinants of health to keep them um, as healthy and well as possible and thereby um, avoiding uh, unnecessary cost. Our area of specialty and focus at NetHealth is pay for performance programs. And our experience in these programs um, has taught us that they can be very effective and work if designed well in the real world. So we have a couple of poll questions for you, Garrett. Okay, so on your screen, 
you will see a question and it is how have you uh, how you have been directly involved in the uh, design of value-based care pay uh, for performance program and so this is a choose or I'm sorry <laughs> Gosh, have you been directly involved, yes or no, uh, in the design of a value-based care pay for performance program? So this is just a simple yes and no, and we're going to wait for the responses to come in here. And while those are happening, uh, Janine, are you able to see this on your screen or do I need to read the results to you? I am not able to see it. Okay. So, uh, in just a second here, we'll close it down and then I will share the results with everybody and you will be able to see. And this first question, of course, focuses on the design of a pay for performance program. Correct. Okay. And of course, this is anonymous. So this, you know, you, this just give you a chance to see where you stack among your colleagues. So, okay. I think most of the responses have come in. Let me go ahead and share the results. Okay. Looks like we have uh, 41%. Uh, said yes, they were uh, directly involved in the design, and then 59% said no. Okay. So I'm going to close that out. And then we've got uh, the another one that we're going to do. Same deal. You'll see on your screen, and this is, have you been directly involved in the implementation of a value-based care pay for performance program? So whereas the other one was in design, this one has to do with the implementation. And again, this is anonymous. And we've got the results are coming in here. It looks like most people have answered, but we still got some results coming in. So I'm going to close it down in about five seconds here. About five, four. Three, two, and one, and then I will share the results. There we go. Okay, so uh, yes, we have 59% have been directly involved in implementation, and 41% uh, have not. Okay. Yes, we'll flip. <laughs> so more people have been involved in the implementation, um, but haven't really been directly involved in the design. And that's, that's really interesting, and we wanted to ask that question because we find that the more that we involve stakeholders in the design phase of these programs, the more invested, obviously, they are. And, um, and that really leads to really better and, and more effective programs um, with, with higher satisfaction among all stakeholders. So we're going to share some information about that. So just a little bit of, of our background, um, we started working with nursing facilities that were participating in some of the earliest Medicaid uh, VBP programs um, in states like Texas and California back in 2017. And um, they wanted to understand how they could possibly do better in these programs since we had most of the data already um, that the metrics they would be evaluated against were, were um, in these programs. And so we created solutions to help them understand their performance in real time, did things like forecasting of projected payments, and gave them tools to really improve quality where quality outcomes start um, with our analytics. And then um, in 2019, we had the opportunity to be selected as the data intermediary for the first nursing facility VVP program in New Mexico, and subsequently in 2020, added a second nursing facility program. And then um, in 2022, started working with New Mexico on their hospital VVP program um, that was launched last year. And um, now we're working um, with other states and we're working in other settings, including primary care. So we've really um, taken the lessons learned and the successes and, and helped um, other, other states, having discussions with other states about how they can achieve similar results and how we can achieve those types of successful results in um, other settings. And that's really our focus is to innovate with intention, to look at where the areas of priority are, to focus in on um, on those areas 
um, among different provider types and settings. And you know, these types of programs can be applied in any type of delivery system, whether it's fee-for-service or managed care. We can focus in on different domains and populations. Um, and different states have different priorities in terms of those things. Um, and specifically, health plans and payers also have um, you know, certain populations where they're operating um, that are of interest to them. We always advocate for kind of a balance or a blend of different types of measures um, in our advisement. And there are a number of different data sources that we can utilize across different provider settings. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Nadia, who's really going to talk about data analytics and the role that analytics has in informing decision making. Thank you, Janine. So um, to us, a VBP program is essentially an analytics program, right? right? And I'll, I'll explain why. So if we think about VBP uh, as a complex puzzle of specific components, what we want is um, to fit these pieces together. And the way we do it is by using analytics, statistics, data science techniques. So what are these components of a VBP P4P program? The funding mechanism uh, refers to the method by which financial resources are allocated to providers, ensuring equitable distribution and resource utilization across the landscape. So here we determine how funds are collected, distributed, utilized within the program. In the program, we need a ruler tailored to measure specific aspects of healthcare quality. So we're not just picking any ruler off the shelf. We are designing and selecting precise measurement tools um, needed to assess things like patient outcomes, readmission rates, medication adherence, patient satisfaction, and so on. We have a component of assessing performance. This is heavily um, analytical component. It involves the systematic evaluation of the performance of the providers against pre-established quality measures and benchmarks. Um, we also design payment methodologies um, that reflect the quality of care provided. And so the methodologies for payment are then akin to determining reimbursement based on performance. And these payment methodologies need to be fair, transparent, and directly tied to quality metrics. And it's this linkage between financial incentives with desired outcomes that uh, really motivates providers to prioritize high quality and cost-effective um, care delivery. The last component is about evaluation of the whole program holistically, not the provider's performance, but the whole program in and on itself. Uh, we do regular evaluation um, of the quality measures we have selected, the payment models we have designed, the incentive uh, payments that we have um, uh, as part of the design of the program. So we analyze all of the data on the outcome, the costs, the provider's behaviors, to identify areas for improvement and inform um, necessary program modifications. It's this ongoing evaluation uh, of the whole program that um, ensures that we remain responsive to the changing uh, healthcare needs and we adapt to drive better outcomes over time. So let's dive in a little bit in some of the more analytical aspects um, that come into play into this um, components that we talked about. Selection of measures. Um, it is a very crucial part of the VBP program. As you can imagine, um, these measures serve as indicators of the quality of care that is provided by, um, by the healthcare facilities that um, participate in the program. Um, we need to pick measures that align with the program's goals and accurately reflect the desired outcomes. Also, pick very few um, outcomes and you can't really understand the landscape within a state. Pick too many measures and you have an incomprehensible, non-interpretable uh, program. So we want relevant and meaningful quality measures um, so that we can effectively assess and incentivize uh, quality of care. There are uh, uh, many, many types of measures that we can select from. Uh, clinical outcomes, process measures, uh, patient experience, cost and utilization measures, risk adjusted measures, composite measures, uh, structural measures, and so on. Um, there is a wealth of, of measures available to pick from um, to assess the performance of the providers. In the next slide, we're going to talk about baselines and um, benchmarks. So baselines provide essentially the starting point against which improvement can be measured. 
and benchmark to represent the desired level of performance that we want the providers um, to achieve. So peer comparisons involve benchmarking of um, performance against similar providers, but also against national or regional metrics that we have uh, identified and um, defined within a program. Um, these comparisons allow providers to understand how they fare relative to their peers. And this is how we identify areas of improvement or best practices that need to be adopted within the program. It's essentially like um, establishing standards of excellence um, in healthcare. So when we talk in the next slide about assessment, performance assessment needs to be unbiased. Um, and it's vital to be unbiased to ensure fairness and reliability in evaluating um, the healthcare facilities. All methodologies need to be objective, they need to be transparent, we need to base everything on reliable data sources. Uh, and to do that, we leverage scientific methods for the calculations and the reporting um, so that we have trustworthy and reliable results and also you know, free from any distortion or, or, or manipulation. In the next slide, we're going to start going into the discussion about the variation among providers within a state. So in a way, what we do in a VBP program is study the variation of the different providers. One way to do that is by identifying and handling outliers. Outliers can be poor performing facilities or top performing facilities. We need to identify and appropriate handle these facilities within a program. First of all, we need to distinguish who have exceptional performance and distinguish it from potential data anomalies. These two are not the same. And once we identify the outliers, we need to understand the reasons behind their um, behavior and take appropriate actions. So for example, for the most poor performing facilities, we can provide additional support and investigate potential issues, but we also want to leverage the success stories of providers that are top performers and we want to replicate um, what they do in their facilities to other providers. So in the next slide, another way to account for the facility variation is through the statistical methodologies we use and they are um, inherent to the quality measures that we pick. So for example, we can use risk adjusted measures. Uh, risk adjustment is a statistical methodology. A lot of you probably know that takes into account factors that may influence performance outcomes such as, for example, patient acuity or sociodemographic factors. So by appropriately adjusting for the facility variation, the program can provide a more accurate reflection. We create a level playing field to, to compare the facilities and understand um, the, the accuracy of the quality care that is delivered within the state. If we move to the next slide, we're going into um, the, the payment calculation. Uh, we need clear, and straightforward payment calculation methodologies. This is crucial um, for all the stakeholders of a VBP pro program, providers, state, uh, payers. Uh, everybody needs to be able to understand and comprehend how payments are determined from the beginning of the calculation to, till the final um, result of the dollars associated for each provider, right? Um, by employing straightforward and transparent methodologies, we have learned that the program can promote accountability and it also encourages participa participation from healthcare providers, which is crucial. You want your providers to be champions of the program, right? And um, having transparent payment calculation is definitely um, a deal breaker for them. Um, in the next slide, so how do we do all of that? Throughout the whole life cycle of the VBP program design and implementation, we are we are employing modeling and what if scenarios. These, these tools are quite uh, vital because uh, they allow policymakers to simulate and assess the potential impact of different program parameters and incentive structure. Um, so for example, we might simulate the effects of allocating resources to different providers. So if we use what if scenarios and modeling, the program can be designed more effectively to optimize outcomes. And importantly, we, we make sure we anticipate pot potential unintended consequences before the implementation. So we can see what our decisions um, will result to, and based on data-driven um, 
processes, we can then select what is the most appropriate path forward um, for implementation. Um, moving on, while VBP programs, we all know, have the potential to incentivize quality, improve pa patient outcomes, target health disparities, uh, lead to effective and efficient use of funds. Uh, on the other hand, a poorly designed program can be ineffective or worse lead to unintended harm, right? So what are some best practices that can guide us in avoiding these detrimental effects? So going back a little bit on the literature, in 2022, the Center for Health Policy Evaluation in Long-Term Care released a review of nursing home Medicaid VBP payment programs. The study evaluated 30 nursing facility Medicaid VBP programs identified across 24 states. It is quite interesting because that number marks a substantial increase from the last national survey, which was done in uh, 2008, where there were only nine programs in effect and five considering adopting one. And this highlights the, the, the growing emphasis on value-based care initiatives across the nation, right? So anyway, previous evaluations of VBP uh, programs across various settings have identified the key best practices from program design. And these encompass funding, performance measures, performance assessment, and linkage to payment, which we talked about as the crucial components of VBP programs, right? So what they did in this study, um, every, pro uh, every program underwent evaluation across these themes, resulting in an overall score. Programs that scored at the highest were classified as fully or highly aligned, followed by um, a class of programs labeled as moderate, moderately aligned, and then the last category of slightly aligned programs. Remarkably, only four programs achieved fully or highly aligned status. And I'm very happy to say that two of these programs are actually the Net Health uh, New Mexico State Medicaid programs. Um, going down a slide as we explore further then, um, let's keep in mind the, the adherence to, to expert recommendations. It is crucial for the success of any uh, VBP program. Um, so we need to have programs that are predictable, they are transparent, they are consistent. We incorporate stable benchmarks for assessing performance. We don't want to have a moving target all the time for the providers. It's not fair to them. And ideally, we want to follow a tiered payment structure, which we've learned that um, is much more straightforward in terms of incentivizing um, the, the facilities. Of course, while some programs align well with these best practices, others exhibit significant variation uh, and potentially impacting their effectiveness, as we discussed. So let's look a little bit how these uh, best practices can shape the trajectory of the VBP program. Um, one thing we learned um, is that guiding principles matter. And I would say like, like in any analytics project, the initial setup significantly influences the program's trajectory and effectiveness. So what we establish at the onset um, will serve as the guiding light right throughout the program's life cycle. So we want to have uh, guiding principles that are robust, that are aligned with our goals and designed to drive the outcomes we seek. Um, for example, we have learned through our own experience that first and foremost, we need to align with what the state wants to do, right? Um, then we want to minimize the administrative burden um, of the providers we, uh, and we want to build upon existing processes. Although we can be quite innovative into a VBP program, we don't innovate on anything, right? So we want to make sure providers uh, are focused on what they need to do, which is improve their outcomes. So we don't want to burden them uh, without any reason if we have tools that we can um, we can exploit uh, from the state we're working. Um, so uh, additionally, uh, analytics to understand the variation um, of the healthcare providers um, and of course, regular program reviews that, will, that allow us to stay agile um, and evaluating the effectiveness and making necessary adjustments um, along the way. So let's look at a sample methodology on how to bring all of that together when we design something. So in a simple, straightforward, transparent quality assessment framework, uh, one thing we can do, like each quality measure uh, carries a designated point value. 
we juxtapose the facility QM values against predetermined cap points, the benchmarks that we have defined, um, and assign points based on established ranges that are defined from these benchmarks. We add all the points together and cumulatively these points determine the classification of the facility or um, we call it the performance tier. This performance tier is linked to how much money the provider is going to get based on their performance. Because not everybody is going to be a top performer, at least not at the beginning of a BBP program. Uh, there, is, uh, there are funds that remain, um, the residual funds, but we follow a similar um, tiered percentage approach to, again, reallocate whatever is left on, on the table, ensuring equi equitable distribution across providers. So the tiered percentage structure, we know, we know from the literature, we know from our own experience, is very, very ben beneficial for a VBP program because it can differentiate the performance and incentivize improvement. But as we transition from discussing the design and best practices, it's also crucial to explore how these elements can seamlessly integrate into implementation, particularly when we are working with software and we put all these pieces together. Um, so, if we're talking about a state-specific VBP P4P scorecard, what's crucial is to give real-time insight into quality out outcome and payments for providers, to the states, and other stakeholders that participate into a VBP program. We need timely access to the data and insights because we need to make informed decision-making. Um, so it's all about providing the right information at the right time to drive actionable insights. We do a lot of analysis behind the scenes. So if we go to the next slide, um, we, we use analysis called cross-sectional analysis. Uh, think of them as taking a snapshot of a situation at a single point in time, like taking a photograph, right? So visibility into why targets aren't met is paramount for a continuous improvement. We need to have real-time insights into the performance gaps so that the providers can identify and focus on the areas that need attention promptly. Um, and by understanding the root causes, they can implement targeted interventions to, to, to address the challenges they face and ultimately drive better outcomes. If we go to the next slide, of course, we need easy to understand real-time measure performance. It's key for the providers to, to track progress one image is 1,000 words, right? So we know, we learned uh, that intuitive and straightforward visualizations allows for quick interpretation of performance and quick identification of the areas where um, the provider needs to focus for improvement. So it's all about an, on our dashboard, when we think about how we develop a dashboard, it's about making all the complex data that come into play into the VBB program, um, make them accessible and, and actionable. The next slide, uh, we see a sample of how uh, we can look at the calculations of the payment. Uh, as we discussed before, offering real-time payment calculations and utilization is paramount. Um, providers need to understand what's going on uh, during the um, performance period that they are looking at, also historical performance periods. Um, it provides facilities with immediate feedback on their financial performance and utilization uh, patterns. And again, real-time insight enables proactive adjustments. The next slide, we'll see another type of analysis. We, we, we do longitudinal analysis. We want to understand changes over time, detect improvements um, or not improvement over time. So we need to understand the trends um, of the quality measures across time. But we also need to, um, to look at any granularity of the data we have. Uh, aggregated information at the facility level is um, number one for, for, um, for a dashboard um, for a VBP program, but we need to have access to patient uh, level data. It's the drill down from facility to the patient level outcomes that offers a comprehensive view of the drivers of the performance. Um, so we need to zoom in and zoom out all the time uh, during our uh, analysis of, uh, of the data for a VBP program and our software needs to reflect this you know, granularity of the data in order for the providers to understand way, way, the ways they can intervene um, to improve the, 
to improve the outcomes. And lastly, we've learned that, you know, we need to have a software that is one stop shop, right? Having in-app uh, program information and FAQs enhances the engagement of the providers, their understanding, um, offering readily accessible resources within the platform, foster transparency, and empowers the providers to use the software um, to drive better outcomes. So I'll stop here with one note saying that the software about a VBB program and a scorecard, we discussed a little bit about the elements that are crucial for it, but it's also, since we have a plethora of data when we're, we are, we are um, working on a VBB program, we can create a, a portfolio of analytic solutions to support our providers even more. And Janine is gonna take it from here and talk to you more about this. So I'm going to talk about the outcomes of effective real life programs and, you know, keeping the people in mind. We have, for example, in nursing facilities, we have individuals who in the morning are hospitalized and in the afternoon are in a nursing facility. And the impact of these kinds of programs across settings just cannot be overestimated. Um, we really have to understand that these programs affect the outcomes of people. So while we focus on the outcomes of providers and the outcomes across states and the outcomes across payers and health plans, it's really all about the people. And never has this been more real for me than in the last few months as I've been navigating the healthcare system with my own elderly parents. So from a state agency perspective, um, generally, state agencies have three areas of, of objectives. The first is that they need to effectively use the funds um, that they're um, having allocated in their budgetary processes and that they're getting through CMS directed payments, as many of these programs are funded um, and, and the ones that we're going to focus on in terms of outcomes. They need to meet the goals and objectives of their quality strategies, and they need to meet performance targets across providers and across settings. And increasingly, um, CMS has placed increased scrutiny on state Medicaid agencies, particularly in directed payment um, programs, to show that they're meeting, that they're setting appropriately performance targets and that they're meeting them in these types of programs. So specific to um, some real world examples, the goals and objectives that New Mexico had for their nursing facility VVP programs were to achieve better value for Medicaid funds that were spent on care, avoiding unnecessary hospitalization and adverse events and improving their quality outcomes, to create incentives for providers to improve or maintain high levels of quality. One of the things that was really important to them was to uh, provide opportunities in these programs for providers to have early wins and also to incentivize that ongoing quality improvement. And that's one of the reasons that a tiered um, structure was implemented because that provides an, incentiv uh, an incentivization for providers to continue to improve in quality and to increase access to services, which is increasingly an area of focus for CMS um, and supporting the care of higher acuity beneficiaries to get access to nursing facilities and encouraging, um, for example, specifically the use of telemedicine to increase access to services. So how, how have these programs been effective in these areas? Well, up here in the upper left is an illustration of what was done to kind of gradually ramp up to a full pay for performance. So something that you can do um, in a program is, um, for example, front load um, the, the points in a tiered system so that providers see um, early wins. You can um, measure things like the high acuity bed days. And, and we saw an increase initially um, in those high acuity bed days. And then we all, we experienced something, you know, called the pandemic, right? So that's something we're continuing to watch. Um, increased telemedicine visits means an increase in access to um, those services that might not otherwise be available. And achieving high levels of support and satisfaction is a really good indicator that stakeholders are satisfied with the program. 
um, having good survey satisfaction scores and, and providers providing testimonials um, that are really champions of the program. So there were also performance targets set, um, targets to improve quality of care um, by decreasing mean rates of long stay residents with antipsychotic medications, UTIs, falls with major injury and symptoms of depression. Um, there was a performance target set because there are, was already excellent performance in um, pressure ulcers, maintaining the mean rate across all providers in the state and increasing the rates of long stay resident influenza and pneumococcal vaccination. Um, and in terms of utilization measures, reducing avoidable hospitalizations by decreasing the mean long stay resident hospitalization rates. So these are all about optimizing the health of, of those members receiving services and nursing facilities. And we're happy to say that um, the utilization and the, and the um, clinical targets have been met. And so that tells us that the program has been effective, that providers are, are behind it, and all of the targets being met means that now we have to look to um, what do we do next. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. From a provider perspective, and I spent a lot of years operating nursing facilities, and, and I always kind of come at things from the angle of, you know, how does, how, what, what needs to happen in order for providers to really buy in and, and achieve improvements and kind of give these programs their all. And what we've seen through our experience is that providers can achieve financial benefits in effective VVP programs. They can, do that by improving quality, and that it can also have an effect on their operations. So sharing some of those stories, you know, how do they do that? They do that by really connecting the dots. The facilities that are most successful and the providers that are most successful in any VBP program do these things by understanding that quality begins by ensuring that the data they're collecting is accurate. Then they focus on preventing quality measures from triggering in the first place by preventing adverse events for their patients. Prediction of adverse events and intervening so that those things do not occur is the key to making the most quality improvement. They track and, and they have the ability to see in real time their quality outcomes understanding their performance compared to benchmarks, seeing their trends over time, that's all key to understanding how they're doing um, in real time and to be able to change the, the trajectory of that at the facility or provider level. And that leads to the success that they can have um, in almost any type of value-based care program. For example, you know, nursing facilities, um, have access in, in the New Mexico programs to a number of different solutions that help them do all of those things. Of course, they have access to a real-time scorecard. They have access to patient-level predictive analytics to help them understand who's at what level of risk for adverse events like pressure ulcers and falls and hospitalization, and even who's at risk for mortality. So if there is um, an end of life care conversation that needs to happen, then that can be facilitated and unnecessary hospitalizations can be avoided. And then they need to understand their facility performance. How accurate is their data? Making sure that they are providing care that's in accordance with best practices, looking at all of their, their quality outcomes in real time and preventing readmissions hospitalizations and and even understanding and impacting things like their five star ratings and it all this all works together um, to improve their quality performance. And here's an example of what um, the patient level analytics will will look like across some really important areas, both descriptive analytics to tell them the level of impairment that each um, patient or resident has and predictive analytics to help them understand the risk for those events. And not just the levels of impairment or risk, but some of the factors that are contributing to that. So to the extent that it's possible, 
they can address those factors and either hopefully turn them around or if they can't reverse them, then manage them so that um, they don't develop complications or if they do develop complications, then they can um, avoid other types of complications that might be associated. So providers can actually achieve financial benefits. Um, of course, direct payments in the P4P programs, but also things that might not seem obvious, like avoiding unpaid Medicaid bed hold days. Um, when uh, a Medicaid beneficiary is admitted to the hospital, they don't, the nursing facility does not continue to get an unlimited amount of payment for those bed days in, in any state. So decreasing unnecessary hospitalizations has a financial benefit to the facility um, and decreasing adverse events decreases their cost. For example, the, the cost of treating a pressure ulcer, the cost of um, treating complications from a fall. Um, and so those are really, really important outcomes as well. And in, in the programs um, that we're involved with, they also get tools to help them with their skilled patients, not just their long state patients. So we help them increase the reimbursement, but in a compliant way for skilled patients by making sure that their coding is absolutely accurate. Improving quality can't be, can't be overstated, the importance of that. Um, so managing those residents' risk factors helps improve quality of care outcomes, but it also improves their quality of life. Obviously, that's absolutely the most important thing to patients and their families. Um, it helps them understand that the tools and the visibility of information that providers have helps them understand how they can truly be data-driven in their quality improvement processes. Nursing facilities, for example, have regulations that require them to have certain types of quality improvement activities in their facilities. There are regulatory standards for that. One of those things is that they be data driven. That's something that's easily said and harder done. And um, if they have these kinds of tools through VBP programs, it makes it much easier to, to meet those requirements for them. Better quality measure outcomes and higher five-star ratings have many, many benefits, um, including quality measures that are not in, in the P4P programs. And we see um, that effect in some facilities as well. And they also do better in the federal Medicare, SNF, VBP, and QRP programs because they have additional tools and because they're implementing these replicable, scalable processes that help them improve quality, they can apply those things to all different types of quality improvement. And in terms of operations, which was you know, my area of focus for 16 years, having the tools and the information that they have in these programs helps, helps facilities allocate resources more wisely. They can focus on the areas that matter the most and where they can have the biggest impact. Um, they can thereby increase you know, skilled referrals and, and achieve a preferred provider status once they um, are able to demonstrate the quality improvement and the level of quality performance that their referral sources really care about. It also may help them understand what they're really good at and what they might be able to be better at and where they might wanna specialize in needed programs and services. There is a great need for behavioral health, for example, and care, uh, complex care for certain types of patients and individuals in the healthcare system. And facilities who really take hold of these kinds of quality improvement initiatives may be better positioned to provide those kinds of specialized care and services. In some cases, facilities and, and um, operations People have felt more comfortable taking on risk-based contracts and arrangements, such as um, you know, agreeing to value-based performance targets in their managed care contracts, or even um, starting a special needs program um, in their organizations. So it can really set the stage for all kinds of um, a ripple effect in terms of operational um, focus. And one of the things that we always look at is, you know, what are what are the proof points of satisfaction? And 
um, we've been very gratified to see that among all the different types of stakeholders in the state of New Mexico, they're very satisfied, beyond satisfied in many cases, um, with these programs and, and all the things that it has brought to them. So what's ahead? So once you, you achieve excellence, you can't be, um, you can't be satisfied with, with that, right? So right now they're looking at a um, potential changes to the program. As Nadia said, it's always important to take a successful program or any program um, and do that evaluation, that ongoing evaluation. Um, and right now we're looking at, you know, what changes maybe need to be made for, um, for future performance periods um, and what additional performance targets could be set or maybe even um, different types of measures um, or switching measures out in the programs. And just to end on this note, you know, ultimately VBP programs are about people. And um, in many of these, most of these examples, um, these providers are caring for a very complex and vulnerable patient population. And these programs affect not only them, but their families. And so we tend to talk about performance targets and quality measure rates and facility and provider performance, but really it's all, all, all about people. And so that's why we do what we do. And with that, I will turn it back over to Garrett for the Q&A. All right. Uh, yeah, we did have a number of questions that came in from the audience. So if you do have a question right now, uh, go ahead and, and submit it using your control module. And we're going to get to as many as we can. And first of all, Thank you guys so much. This is a wonderful presentation. Obviously, there's a lot here. So don't worry. The slides will be available uh, to you after. But if you have a question, we're going to go ahead and get to uh, as many as we can now. First question is this. Uh, what role do patient reported outcomes play in assessing performance in these type of initiatives? OK, so patient reported outcomes. So patient satisfaction um, and patient reported outcomes um, kind of are two similar um, concepts. And that is one of the areas that we, um, we explore when designing a VBP program. Um, we have experience at NetHealth with patient reported outcomes measures for therapy. Um, and that's its, its own um, area. Nadia, do you want to talk about that one a little bit? This is Sorry, it was mute. Um, so it it really de depends on the methodologies for for each of the categories that Janine mentioned, right? So the experience. So we want to have multiple types of outcomes within a VBP program. We don't only want to assess reported outcomes. We don't only want to assess process outcomes, right? We need to have. A, variation so that we can understand the variation of the providers. Some providers are doing better in certain things and, and, and some better in others. Um, experience measures are indicative of, you know, like the, the quality of care that it is indeed provider. provided. Patient reported outcomes, they are usually risk adjusted and, and including risk adjusted measures in a VBP program is quite powerful. It's our only way to actually ensure fair um, comparison among the among among the the providers. And when we're talking about outcomes, risk adjustment is, is paramount. So, so we typically want to have um, a variation of outcomes, and we want to be careful to have risk adjusted patient reported outcomes um, so that they provide the information um, that is relevant and fair when we use it to compare providers. So I would say to, to answer the question directly, it's it, there the presence of patient reported outcomes is quite significant on in any VBP program. I, I would always include a couple of measures like that, even if they are quite complicated and um, as uh, VBP stakeholders, we might need to engage in uh, more education um, for the providers. I think it's crucial to, to have them in. Great. 
Uh, next question is this. Uh, do you weight the measures differently, meaning do you give a different number of points for different measures? And if yes, how do you decide how many points you give for each measure? Sometimes we do. Um, and Maddie can speak specifically to this, but we use scientific methods and what if scenarios and modeling to determine um, the points ultimately assigned to measures. It, it all has to do with, with analysis of the data, right? Like we pick historical information to understand what has been going on in the state. We want to understand the variation between providers. We need to have enough variation so that we separate performance. Um, and based on what the distribution of the data is telling us, first we understand whether the measure is relevant for the specific program, whether it has enough room for improvement, because we don't want to target um, measures that have topped out, right? We need to have enough variation so that improvement can be made. And based on the distribution of the data, we then um, create classes of performance that are then assigned different uh, different points. It really depends on what the data are telling us. And it is one of the things, the most important thing was when we do the quality measure selection, um, before we even go into the benchmarking, um, that we have enough information there to work with. Um, we've been in situations where uh, states have um, selected measures based on their experience. And we go and do the analysis and we see that these measures are not going to work out for multiple reasons, maybe because of administrative uh, burden, maybe because of, of not enough variation. But it's essentially the data that drive the decisions about how we distribute the points and how and, and what points we provide in, in, in the classes that we create uh, of performance. Okay, great. Uh, so, unfortunately, we are kind of running towards the end of our time, um, uh, th but don't worry, if you had a question that you submitted, uh, or if you want to go ahead and submit one now, someone will reach out to you uh, via email afterwards and make sure we we answer your question. But uh, as we close out, first of all, I want to thank uh, you both for a fantastic presentation and wanted to encourage you all to head over to VBC Exhibit Hall dot com and check out the virtual exhibit booth for net health there's a lot of great information here uh, there are a lot of resources you can see what they're doing in the space learn a little bit more about them and of course there's uh, ways to reach out to them and it's just a really neat tool to be able to uh, uh, see what they're doing and there's a lot of great resources there as well in our our library and then finally if you would like to reach out to the net health team um, or to either of our speakers today. Their contact information is here on the screen. This will be included in the slides, of course, that we share with you. Um, but Or you feel free to, to reach out to me directly, and I'm happy to facilitate an introduction or connect you. But thank you all again so much for joining us today. Appreciate you spending your afternoon with us. This is a fantastic uh, session. Uh, and we, again, we have three more sessions or parts of this. This was part four. So we do have three uh, three more and we'll include the links to those if you want to catch back up in the email and the thank you email that we send you in a little bit. So again, have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you on the next one. Have a good one. Thank you so yeah. much.